Can you take this? Sorry. Sorry. Come here. Give him hell, Harry. This isn't the way I didn't want to. <laughs> Eleven thirty this morning. They announced to us that the plant was going to be permanently closed, put up for sale or lease. They told us that the plant would cease operation by April. And you thought you'd seen the handwriting on the wall. You thought you'd seen it. And I want to tell you that you're wrong. This company doesn't even have the decency to ship our jobs to other American workers. The American worker. Some people have forgotten the craftsmanship he brings to his job. Some say he's not as important as he used to be. Well, to that, we politely answer, bunk. At Zenith, Americans like these produce the color TV that service technicians named more than any other as the one that needs fewest repairs. American workers. Zenith workers. They make sure the quality goes in before the name goes on. We believe that Zenith has tried longer, has tried harder, and has tried more successfully than any other United States company to protect the jobs of its American employees. It is now apparent, however, that unless we take actions that will result in the moving of about 5,000 jobs to lower labor cost areas, it will be impossible for us to protect the interest of our stockholders and the interests of some 15,000 Zenith employees whose jobs will remain in the United States. If we have a democracy and we participate in that democracy, then we as a right, and we have a right, to change this society the way we want it to be run, not the way the private enterprisers want our ship to be run in this country. We have that right. And we have a right to say that that employer has a community responsibility, a responsibility that says you don't go to the place that you can get the cheapest labor or the best tax deal. And I'm not disclassifying Zenith, because there's one hell of a lot of other corporations that are doing the same thing that Zenith's doing, what they're doing to you here in the United States today. That you, when you invest in a community, that it means to be a good citizen. It means to provide jobs for those people that live in that community. And I say to you that if the people in the free enterprise system in this country can't provide the jobs for the American workers, then by God, the government of this country should, and it will someday. Jorgensen. I grew up in Sioux City. I've been here all my life. Stephen's my little boy. And uh, a month after he was born, he had an operation. I don't know the words that they use, but the 
tubes going into his stomach wasn't letting his formula stay down, which was causing him to vomit. And they had to go in and do surgery on him to open up the passageway going into his stomach. And I was so excited about having a little boy. Because I have a little girl named Kimmy. My name is Dennis Jorgensen. I've uh, lived in Sioux City all my life, and I think it's just the right size city to raise a family. It's a nice, clean town. It's relatively f free of crime. I, I've always enjoyed it here. I would not like to move out of this town, let me say. I, I enjoy the kids so much. I want to be able to raise this family, these kids to, uh, to have all the things children should have. I want them to have three meals a day. I want them to have a roof over their head, and I want them to have clothes. And I want them to grow, have a chance to grow up normally, like uh, most children do. Not have to worry about helping the family off when they're 15 or 16 by getting a job. I want them to enjoy their, their childhood. There's so many things wrong with this house, you don't even know how to, where to start. And uh, it's, it's a very slow project to, to get going. You gotta do a little bit here, do a little, little there when you can uh, scrape up the extra money. When I graduated from high school, I really wanted to go into hairstyling. I thought I'd give that a try. Well, once we got married, going to hairstyling school was completely out because uh, I had bills before we got married, and he had bills. And we just knew that we both had to work to pay our bills. I had, had gone to college, and uh, Vietnam War came on, and I uh, left school. I thought I was going to go to service. And the last minute, they didn't want me. So rather than start back to college, I needed a job for a while. At the time, I thought I wanted to work rather than continue to go to school. In September, Zenith came out with a letter. It was signed by the president. It said there was a cutback. They're going to have to move some of their stuff to uh, Taiwan and Mexico. The first reaction was, Zenith had always uh, prided themselves in being an American company, and their advertising had been built around that, what, what a great workforce America had, and how much work you could get out of the American worker. And uh, they're going to turn around and take this all away from the American worker and give it to some other country or some other, other people. And that was sickening. My wife was really worried. I've always got by, and I figured we'd also, too, but, boy, for weeks, all you heard down at work was, what am I going to do? Where are we going to work at? There's no jobs. When I heard that I was going to be laid off, I was in the hospital with Stephen. I almost wanted to cry. I couldn't believe it. It's uh, kind of rough having a baby and then hearing bad news that you might not have a job. I was just very depressed. I thought, working there eight years, and now getting kicked in the butt, it just kind of hurt because um, I plan on probably retiring there. I was thinking in the hospital at the time, after he told me, wondering how we're going to raise our kids, how we're going to make our bills, we might end up losing all we got and have to start all over again someplace else. It's just depressing, very depressing. Because nobody likes the thought of having to start all over again. I know at first it didn't sink in to me. It, and uh, now I'm having to go somewhere else and starting at the bottom. And when you start at the bottom, you've got to start all over with the layoffs, shortages every year. It's a merry-go-round if you don't settle into something. I'd like to go up to the one that started this whole damn mess and punch him right in the nose. <laughs> it's affecting me and my family. You've got to look out for your own family first. I feel sorry for everyone else in, in my boat, but what can you do? My goals in life are just about like everyone else's. I'd like to be able to earn a decent living earning enough money to have a nice home. 
I want to have security for the future. I think that Zenith don't care anymore. They just want that cheaper labor. And they'll go out and get it. I think we should come first before anybody. We've helped them people like in Taiwan. The government's helped them so much. Why don't he start thinking about us now? Start helping us. We ought to make our living by God. The American worker. Over the years, he earned a reputation for craftsmanship. Today, some people say he's lost it. But at Zenith, we know better. Today, American workers like these produce Zenith Color TV, picked for fewest repairs, more than any other brand, in the opinion of TV service technicians. Zenith workers. American workers. I uh, would claim to be a, a, an advocate of free enterprise. I'd claim to be a capitalist, whatever words you want to use. Uh, I don't think that the free enterprise system or the capitalist system has ever succeeded in the world, anywhere in the world, unless there was, was a middle class or a labor class or whatever you want to call it that was well paid and that was able to consume goods. You just can't combine high unemployment uh, with democracy. It can't be done. Well, I think we're on a uh, one-way road to ultimate disaster if we don't do something to protect the jobs of American workers. The uh, television industry, in our opinion, has been a victim of seriously unfair trade practices. We've been a victim of dumping. We've been a victim of uh, unfair and what we regard to be unlawful tax advantages on the part of overseas competitors. And we've been a victim, in our judgment, of flat-out violations of American antitrust laws. All right, let me tell you this, that I personally, and excuse me why I, why I blow a little bit, to those, uh, those around this community, the farmer in Kingsley, the, the businessman in Sheldon, Iowa, and the others who have written in the letters to the editor claiming that it's the high wages and it's a great union contract that we have with Zenith that's driving Zenith to Taiwan and Mexico, I want to say that he's full of shit, and that's the best way I can put it. If they think, if they think that three dollars and thirty cents in our days and time is the reason that we lost our jobs to Taiwan and Mexico, they got another thing coming. I'm charged with the responsibility to negotiate uh, the labor agreements for all the workers that we represent, covering wages, hours, working conditions, conditions of employment. Uh, I am charged with the responsibility to uh, handle all grievances and all disputes in the plants. I have a reputation in this town of, of uh, being a very, very hard bargainer, very hard person that uh, will go and get the goals of the people. I'm very unpopular in this town in many, many circles. Now, I'm not ashamed of that reputation. I worked hard for it. You know, the companies have been very generous in, in building that reputation for me. Uh, one company in town here, when we were on strike, ran full-page ads. Nothing but uh, you know, labeling Dick Sturgeon as the instigator, the troublemaker, the person that's responsible for the strike, and the person that's keeping the strike from ending. Uh, the closing of Zenith is going to be a blow to the city in several ways. There's going to be a massive loss of payroll. But I think even more so, it's going to put on the city some social problems that this town has not faced before. What worries me so much is that when all these people are laid off and lose their jobs, is that the massive problems are going to begin at that time. That it's going to be a constant struggle to keep them qualified for unemployment in the TRA program, the Trade Allowance program. Right now, the the uh, membership at Zenith is, uh, represents over half of our whole union in Sioux City. We have a very special, special problem here where about 93% of the Zenith workers are, are females. Like they're either divorced, widowed, single with kids, or single alone. 
where that is the only income coming into the home. This layoff and these uh, loss of jobs is going to cause a very serious problem because there is no place in Sioux City they're going to be able to pick up that many females and provide them with wages sufficient to be able to support a family. But they're proud people and they and they're they're working rather than taking the handout and they're proud of it. They're very proud of it. And once they are laid off and, and when the benefits do run out in a year or so, they're going to find themselves having to crawl into the welfare office and ask for assistance. We've seen a negative growth in the city. We've been in that position before, but this is far worse than what we've ever seen before. We have seen so many plants close and so many people uh, put out on the street. Somehow, some way in this world, we've got to get back to where we care about each other. And I see it so evident in, in the circles I walk that so many people would get care less what happens to each other, the self-centered. And somehow, some way, we got to get back to the point where if you're hurting, I'm hurting. If you've got a need, I've got a need. And I, I see that that's getting worse and worse every day, that people just don't care. Because I don't think any of us can make it alone. I know I couldn't. Now, they can't get the high levels of living without suffering some of the costs of getting the high levels of living. Some of the costs may be short spells of unemployment, but they will be short if they will take alternative jobs, and alternative jobs are available, sometimes elsewhere or sometimes in Sioux City. I think that uh, a person uh, who in good faith has moved into a certain trained occupation uh, deserves something from society. So I would uh, uh, not say that there's no role for quotas which are being phased out for transfer programs which support people's income, which even might provide them with detailed uh, retraining. I, I think that all of those things are, are necessary uh, and are desirable, not only for the uh, human pain which they alleviate in the short run, but because you know in terms of politics, you won't get the flexible economy which is the best for all of us if you take this ruthless, the public be damned uh, attitude, let the market uh, decide, the market, the market, the market, it, it won't sell. And that's the test for the market. Let's operate in the public interest. And if people want to call that protectionism, I reject that definition on the very basis that every other civilized dem industrial democracy in this world today takes protective measures for the jobs of its citizens except the United States of America. We're the only one that doesn't erect some kind of protection beyond a place at the end of the unemployment compensation line for displaced workers. My name is Janice Dickus. I have three children. My marriage only lasted seven years. I feel like it's a rat race when you're doing it all alone. I feel like I'm under pressure all the time. Rushing off to get to work and rushing to get home to the children. When I met Zenith, I wonder if the children made it to school. What my little one's doing. I know my babysitter goes shopping with my little one. I wonder, too, if they make it back. With Zenith closing down, it has scared me. It changed a lot of plans in my life. Well, here I thought, Working at Zenith, I would build my rights up. I'd build up my Social Security. I'd build up my profit sharing. All my buildings are down. I don't think I would leave the city because it has been my home.
and going into a strange city. I don't know if I could do this by myself. Not by myself and three children, anyhow. With Zenith closing, it means that I cannot take care of my children myself. I brought them into this world, and I feel like I'm the one that should take care of them. I should provide for them in the best way that I can. Come, Lord Jesus, be our death. Let me kiss. I don't like people fooling around with my life. I just really thought that Zenith would be my place to work the rest of my life. That I wouldn't be out looking for another job. To me, a divorcee, they feel, is someone that's always out and not tending to the business at home. Well, I don't want people to talk about me like that because that isn't the way I was brought up. I'm just going to go out and do what I have to do for my family and not worry about my own enjoyment right now. I like to see the kids when I get off work see that everything is okay. It would be terrible to be working for eight hours and come home and find nothing. I spend most of my extra time that I do have with the children. We can have a family as long as we stick together, we work together, and that we just be good to one another and love each other. I probably show more love to them or I'm with them more because there is no father. I want the best for them and it's hard to provide that. I guess I'm like any other parent. You want better for them than what you had. And I can't see being away from your home and going to a job that isn't going to pay anything because I don't feel like it's worth it. If you're going to be out there working, they better pay a decent wage that you can live on. Right now, from life, I just want to go out with the feeling that everything's going to be okay. That there's not going to be worry about this, worry about that. I mean, maybe I look too far into the future, but I still feel like you have to think about it. Well, when people lose jobs, certainly we're always going to be concerned about the fact that uh, for the moment that's going to be causing distress. But what we've got to recognize is that we want that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. You do have to go get the pot of gold, and that does mean making changes. If we want higher levels of living, you do have to move ahead. You can't sit still. You can't conclude that there is progress, even though there are cheaper consumer products. You can't conclude that there is progress by having, having those products built at very substantially lower labor cost and sold cheaper because the only result of that is going to be to pull down everybody's standard of living. Well, the people who apparently are getting hurt in the process of a Sioux City plant closing, for instance, uh, over the spell of their whole lives are being benefited by that kind of plant closing, plant openings that are occurring because they're getting, they were getting higher wages in that plant than they could have gotten elsewhere because the flexibility and adaptability of the economy is such that that plant got located there in the first place. We stand right on the threshold of war in the streets of America because we already have an unemployment problem with a lot of disenchanted minority people being the primary victims of that. And all we need now are a few displaced workers that believe they have legitimate rights to jobs and join that army of the unemployed, and I think you've got the potential for a very hot time in America's streets, and I would
see that as the beginning of uh, the crumbling of a great society. My name is Jeanette Clift, and we're farmers. I keep the books I have for years, and it brings you face to face with reality constantly. We, we do not make a lot of money. We've worked real, real diligently for what we have. You have to fall back on some uh, general income coming in all the time. I went to work at Zenith because we were visibly falling back. I, I felt that I had to have a, an extra means of going forward, helping to get ahead, to uh, maintain a standard of living. I consider my paycheck essential to cover the basic uh, cost of living, the electricity and uh, telephone, the dental bills. When I come home, then I go out to take care of the hogs. If the, the uh, workload has been heavy, I'm almost physically ill. Sometimes then I will lie down and take a nap or rest a little before I go back out and do the hog chores. It's not always easy to do an eight-hour job and then come back home and have uh, at least two hours facing you and maybe even more. I don't believe that anyone can appreciate the um, hard work, physical effort, and long hours that go into farming unless they take part in it. Everybody, I think, dreams of having stable roots, and it's not that easy. It is coming to the point where I will no longer be able to take care of hogs. At one time, I had a very bad back, and at one time, I had a leg operated on. And both of these bother me, especially in uh, diverse weather. And uh, the older you get, the more these things do bother you. It is a never-ending battle. But right now, what I'm looking at is how do you get from 50 to 65? It's not the time of your life that you want to continue to work harder all the time. It's a time where you'd like to start slacking off. I think it's very uh, important to maintain your independence and to help the future generation to maintain their independence. You can't give up uh, the struggle. I don't care if the work is hard or if it's long hours. You have to hang in there and, and try to prepare a world for the, the younger generation. I don't know what we'd be if we didn't have the children to look forward to, and I know that it must have been the same way with our parents. They must have felt very strong about helping to provide a, a world that the children could grow up in that was decent. When they're, the whole family's together, the whole struggle's worth it, and we have such a good time. The, the main thing in our life is, of course, our children. Having them around and, and enjoying them, it's, it's, it's just a lot of fun. I'm really going to miss my job as Zena. Uh, it's clearly a burden that is spread unequally, and this land in right square on the backs of the people who can least, are least able to carry it. There's no other democracy and few other countries of any kind of government uh, in which an individual attracts as much uh, degradation and contempt of his uh, neighbors and friends as does an American when he's out of work. It's your passport absolutely to the respect of your friends, your family, oftentimes your wife even, and if you don't have a job in this country, you don't have anything. What we economists try to do is concentrate not on why that fellow in the horse and buggy industry lost his job, uh, and we don't concentrate even on why he didn't get a job in the auto industry, because it might not be in the same place, but, but why isn't there a job somewhere uh, for him? And the total of job opportunity, that's something which uh, ought to be the business and the serious business of the Federal Reserve and the Congress and the uh, uh, fiscal policy of the, of the president. I am Dora Lee. I'm 55. I've been a widow of be, let's see, be three years this coming January. When Claude was alive, I never worried. But Without him, it doesn't seem to work out. It seemed like I'd take 
five steps ahead and ten backwards. I get out of one mess, I'm in another mess. Every time that we got a little money ahead, it had to go for doctor bills or hospital bills or something like that. He, there was quite a few bills that I had to pay with what money we had. I have always felt bad that I cannot afford a stone for him. This has bothered me. I don't have a marker for the grave. If I can keep my head above water, I hope someday to get a marker for Dad. I tell you, right after Claude died, you know, everybody was willing to help, eager to help. But it kind of slides by. They kind of get tired of it, I guess you would say. They look at you, so you're a widow. Big deal. We got our own lives to live. I found this, I'm sorry to say, to be very true. After a while, they kind of forget that you're over here, that you're around here, that maybe you need a little help. You know, it just, I don't know. I, and I don't think it's just me. I think it's a lot of widows. I'm the only child living. So the burden is on my shoulder of taking care of my mother. I just feel bad that I can't do more for her than what I do. I would like to be able to, oh, really do something spectacular for her, and I, I can't do it. When I got the job as Zenith, Claude said, well, Mom, we're going to make it now. He says, you got something? and you got some benefits, and you're going to be all right. If Zenith was to close down, I don't know what I'd do, because I'm 55 years old. Where do you go? They don't want to be bothered with you. And what am I capable of doing at my age? I'm a very independent person, and I, it bothers me to ask for help. It really hurts me. And I never have asked for help. You know, like food stamps and things like that, I never have. <laughs> I'm very conscientious of my work at Venus. I have to do it right. And that's the way I was brought up. You do things right or you don't do them at all. Well, I hope that that's what made Zenith a successful place is on kind of they had people like me. And there's a lot of them, I'm sure, down there like me that are proud of their job and want to do the job and do do a good job. And I don't think it's right that Zenith should take and just don't take that into consideration. How they can do this to us, I don't know. Well, granted, the 64-year-old worker who has a specific skill that's tied to a specific location, a specific job, does have some adjustment problems that are involved there. Now, the adjustment problems tend to be overplayed, however. We find an awful lot of 70-year-old workers who change jobs and do quite well. Uh, this is a matter of attitude, willingness, uh, adaptability, and adaptability is not just a matter of indigenous human quality, it's a matter of willingness to do the adapting. Women of 55 years of age with barely a high school education who had never worked in any other industry than the shoe industry. Now, there is no way, realistically, that a betting man can say that they are not going out of the labor force, and it would be uh, dishonest not to uh, recognize that. But uh, we have to weigh the advantage of the average person, th those who benefit, those who lose, and it, it works out overall in the long run to the net advantage of the standard of living of the American worker. My name is Michael Kane. I'm Patty's boyfriend. First time I asked Patty to go out on a date, 
I think I was giving her a ride home from work. Before I met Patty, I never even knew a deaf person in my life. And, and it was such a hassle to try to fingerspell everything. We went to a few places. Well, it's hard to be with somebody for a long period of time when there's, you, know, you can't carry on a conversation. But as time went by, I guess she was more patient. And I picked it up. I started taking sign language courses. Within four months, I was able to carry on somewhat of a conversation. I enjoyed being with her. The deaf people she knew mostly were together. And they go to the deaf club on these nights, and they had the deaf athletic uh, activities and stuff like that. Patty used to take me to uh, meet a lot of her deaf friends. And I used to really enjoy it because it was really a different situation. I started to get to know them, and we all basically did the same things that everybody else did except for he talked with her hands and I talked with my mouth. And that was about the only difference. It seemed like we'd have the same taste, the same likes. We'd enjoy to play these kind of games and play those kind of games. You know, there's some people that are cheerful all the time, and I think Patty's that way, and I think people just seem to like her easy. She makes me feel good, because it always seems like she's happy to see me. And, you know, that makes me happy. She's a self-dependent person. I think she gets along on her own real good. Patty's job at Zenith is real important to her because there's where her self-dependence is. There's where she has her house. That's where she has her car. That's where she gets her money to live in Sioux City. If she loses her job at Zenith, you know, she might have an awful hard time trying to find a job, especially with the amount of people in this area that are out of work and uh, she is going to be limited for the job she could get, you know. You have to face it, she isn't going to be able to be a clerk, or a, a teller, a bank teller, or something like that. I told Patty how I felt about it. I told her that I thought it was really a bad deal. That she didn't understand the reasoning behind it, which I don't blame her. I don't understand it either. You know? She's like anybody else. She has to make car payments, pay rent has to eat, and, it, you know, there's no doubt her standard living has to go down. Hey, I think it's absolutely preposterous for anybody in the United States of America to sit back and say, we have it too good, we are too wealthy, we make too much money, or our standard of living is too high. At the very least, we have a world obligation, in my humble judgment, to maintain at least what we have as a standard of living, hopefully perfect it, but at least maintain it as a goal to which all of the balance of the world ought to aspire, and that we ought to be taking every action we can as a people, and as a government, and as concerned human beings with assisting other nations of the world to achieve that aspiration. To do anything else, to me, is retrogressive and antisocial. There are people who would like to live in a world in which there were no barriers. The fact is the world has barriers. And the question is, is whether the American people are getting taken at the expense or for the benefit of other people. My view is they are. Well, if you and I were to look at our Christmas presents, were to look at our year's purchases of durables, we'd see how much of our standard of life would be lost if Fortress America shut its uh, walls to all competition. We wouldn't be as badly off as some unbalanced parts of the world, but uh, life would be shorter, nastier, and a bit more brutish. My name is uh, William Morris. We were one of the first ones that started this uh, American Indian Center years ago. And uh, we tried hard. I made costume. My wife made costume. My name is Arlene Morris, and I was born in Winnebago, Nebraska, on an Indian reservation. I'm a full-blooded Winnebago Indian. No other blood. I quit school 
to get married. I have, I've had 12 children, I have 11 living. Seven daughters and four sons, all within a span of 22 years. I lived life as it came. I guess that's my philosophy in life. You take what comes. When I'm dancing, I put my whole heart in it. When I hear the sound, uh, uh, I get, I get the feeling uh, there's something there. Uh, I think I'm somebody out there anyway. You know, I'm, I'm with my own, own tribe, dancing. So we bring our family and all my children are dancing. I always tell them, get with that drum and dance and dance your heart out. I said, that's what you're there for. Just put your heart into it, and that's what they all do. And I'm proud you know, that my family could be with me. See, we're enjoying ourselves because we work all week. We, then we come home and it, it, we feel good, you know. We've come home a lot of times at 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning and still have to get up and go to work. But we enjoy it, so we say, well, we can suffer Monday. That, that, that's, that's what we do. Zenith changed everything, you know, for me. My pride is lost, you know. Pride is gone, see. I don't know just how to put it, but before, if I went anywhere, I held my head up, you know. Because I had money in my pocket, and I didn't care what I said, you know. And I could always argue with a guy if he says something about my car or and uh, well, I'll fix it up, because I, I, I know I got the money to do it, you know. But now, uh, I, I figure I ain't got that kind of money now, so. I'm the kind of guy that, uh, I want to be the provider alone, you know. I want to make enough money to see him smile when I come in that door. And uh, I done lost that. I don't want to go begging. No, uh, I, I think uh, my children depended on us all the way through this far. We've helped them. We've done all we could for them so far. Deep down, I had an ambition. I wanted to be something. At first, it was a doctor, but maybe that was a child's wish. Then I wanted to be a nurse, because I like to take care of things and see things heal. I wanted to be independent, instead of being dependent all these years on my husband. So I decided to go to work. Well, I feel proud because I'm part of the breadwinner. And when my children want something, I don't have to say, no, you can't have it till when we can afford it. Most of the time I can fulfill their wishes. Well, when I first heard Zenas was going to lay off people or even close down, I guess I just didn't want to believe it. I just left it in the back of my mind, you know, let the other people talk about it. I'm not gonna even think about it. Well, there are moments when I just about think about it and I get frightened that if this happens, I don't want to go home to the reservation. I don't, I don't want to go on the welfare road. Just want to find another job and go to work. Zena did take my dream away, I let, uh, I could retire there. I was kind of despondent, Donald, because, uh, well, myself, I couldn't believe that they're closing it, you know. 
because there's so much there and I know how the people felt too. A lot of them, uh, they depended on, on that place. And we had hopes that the place probably run till I retired. Maybe our children all be working there one of these days, you know. I, I'm closing it, so we'll close the doors on us again, see. Then we're gonna uproot. We have to leave everything we can't haul it in one car. We can just take what clothes we could use and leave the rest and just go. Yeah, everything, giving, giving everything up. I'll probably someday come back, but not until I retire. Uh, I don't know, if you're young, you could say all oh, the hell with it, you know. Get another job somewhere else, but easier, you know, or something like that. But me, I'm getting the age where, you know, if I'd, I never have to look for another job again. Uh, now it's gone. I'd probably walk in some place and. Uh, it's all oh, you're too old, you can't use you. You know, I, I know I'm gonna hear that a lot of places. But I still think I got a lot of fire left in me to build one, I tell you. I had a very tough life uh, when I was a kid. A lot of meals there, I can say I come away from the table hungry, see. And uh, so I tell them now, this is worth working. We can afford it. We can ride them out, eat all that meat up. Don't waste no food. And we have all kinds of trimmings when we're eating. And they say, fill up every one of you. Get plenty to eat. And I, I explained to him when I was a kid, I didn't have this. And I said, uh, today, I'm going to tell you right now, so you'll know go hungry as long as I'm flying. Because I went through it. I know what it was. I guess maybe my belief in God is so strong that I think he's going to take care of us. He's He's going to find us something, I find us a way. There are alternative jobs available. The people are laid off in the import competing industries, are being laid off in the economy where 20 million people change jobs every year. We're eliminating low wage jobs and increasing the number of high wage jobs. My last day at Zenith was probably one of the lowest days I've ever experienced in my life. It's a day that I hope I never have to go through again. I didn't want to miss anybody. I wanted to um, be certain that I told them how I felt about working with them. And I didn't want to leave until I could see you. A year ago, I never you felt a, a threat. I was very comfortable with my life and the way we lived and the fact that the job will always be there. We put uh, our property on the market right away. It's not sold. There's people who've been out here and looked. But uh, nothing has happened yet. We have resolved that we're not going to move as a family. That's for certain. Uh, the family will stay here until this property is sold. I think the bottom line was that we're going to be separated. My family will have to stay here in Sioux City. And uh, the kids will go back to school here. And my wife will be here alone. I'll go to Minneapolis, find an apartment or some place to live for a while. I'm really starting all over again with another job, another home, another city. 
everything is going to be a, a restart. Uh, friends, you know, it won't be the same. <laughs> to our wonderful friends, the Alberts, Richard, Joya, Mike, Mark, and last but not least, is Dan. As neighbors, they're always ready with a helping hand. Their hobbies are far but few. Richard Wells gardens, works with wood, photography, and we think he's a genius too. Joanne paints, plays the organ, makes all sorts of things, but water she can't boil. <laughs> hobby is working in God's soil. She plants thousands of seeds, which they are aware, and pots them individually with love and tender care. They, Mike, Mark, and Dan are two boys, and to Richard and jo Joanne are real joys. They have a fight now and then, and talking their way out of things is, is quite shrewd. But Richard, the referee, when sometimes settling things comes quite on blue. <laughs> now, dear friends, we don't like to see you move away and tell you this is so hard to say. As your friends will always be true, good luck and may God bless you. Oh, American workers. Some people say they're not as good as they used to be. Well, to that, we politely answer, bunk. Behind every Zenith color TV are thousands of American workers like these. The labor savings by moving offshore are substantial. Um, I would guess that the savings are probably in the area of five to $7,000 a job. It's our experience at Zenith that the men and women that we had in our American plants were every bit as productive as any we've ever had overseas. It's our opinion that they produced products that were of every bit as high quality as any products that we've produced overseas. They are substantially higher paid. Uh, there isn't any way you're going to ask men and women to walk into American plants and work for 25 cents an hour or a dollar an hour. So the American employee is substantially uh, higher paid. My name is Jim Ryan. I'm the general manager of Zenith Taiwan Corporation. I have found the working conditions here very favorable. Um, the people themselves, they are willing to take on tasks and assignments irregardless of the extent of that task. If it requires 10 to 14 hours a day of work, this is complied with. Well, the average week uh, consists of 45 actual working hours. The average salary on a monthly basis would be about uh, $51 a month, U.S. money. We provide a meal subsidy. We provide one meal a day, which is their lunch. We also provide transportation subsidy. It is figured as a fringe benefit um, to the base. In the world at large, although we do not have free trade, we have freer trade than we did 20 years ago or 40 years ago. Now, mind you, it's still difficult to land goods in Japan and market them and sell them, and there are restrictions in France and in many markets against us, uh, just as we have uh, restrictions against uh, foreign merchandise. But if you count the quantitative amount of this, it is less than it used to be. I won't tell you that free trade is a false goal. I don't know whether it's a false goal or not. It is not going to be achieved in my lifetime, and I don't think there's anybody in the government who would suggest it'll be achieved in my lifetime. And in the period when we don't really have free trade, then I think it's important that we make certain that we are not being out-negotiated. Barrier for barrier, do unto uh, others as you would have others do unto you, and uh, what we get is what we should uh, practice. And in that way, you'll have fair trade. It may not necessarily be as free as it is now, but it'll sure be fairer. We do need verification of the Social Security numbers. Your Social Security card, a paycheck stub, to verify the number before you leave. What we're doing is going to use this form here to help set up your file so that when you are eventually laid off because of the imports, 
we will have already started a file for you in Des Moines for the trade readjustment. We're going to start working on those now, so please fill it out carefully. If you have any problems, any questions, please raise your hand. Mr. Tom or Mr. Kacharis will be around to help you. First off, let's just go ahead with the large form. Starting up there in the upper left-hand corner, your Social Security number with box number one. Middle initial and the small box in the center, number three. Leave the month blank for birth date. I need just the last two numbers of the year in which you were born. Next space over to the right, United States citizen, yes or no? So your residence. So what we want is if you reside in Iowa, we want you to put in the number 1919. Everything else is completed here except if you will drop down about two inches on the form, it says number 35 on the left hand side. Please sign here. I'm Jim Conley, the operations manager of Reynosa. We're paying the minimum salary under Mexican law, 122 uh, pesos per day. It's about $5.42 a day. But for $5.42 a day, we have not had any problem attracting workers. Labor is very cheap. We work six days a week, eight hours a day, 48 hours a week is the normal Mexican work week by law. Uh, they want to learn. They're hardworking people. The people need the jobs. And I mean really need the jobs. They exist at almost the poverty level. I am uh, pleased with what Zine has been able to do for the Mexican people in Reynosa. It's a successful manufacturing operation. Everybody seems to forget that America is the world's marketplace. America is where they want to go. America is where these producers look as the market for their products. And as a consequence of that, the American worker is the only one that loses in the whole cycle because his job disappears. He has nothing but uh, short-term protection for his uh, existence, his standard of living, the future of his family. The corporation's profits go on uninterrupted as long as they have this free access back to the American marketplace. The foreign worker is exploited because of his low wage rate and the prohibition uh, of unions or the ruthless suppression of them in most of these places. And because he is exploited, he never earns enough money building that product to become a consumer of it. And for that reason, 100% of it comes back to the United States. And everybody goes merrily on except the American worker. He's the one that's left out of the circle and uh, bears the brunt of it. Tonight's meeting will be the probably the final meeting we'll have before plant shutdown. We're going to cover the things that, that uh, we think are going to help you as the plant closes down, your unemployment extends. We don't want welfare. We don't want handouts. We'd rather not be on unemployment in TRA. We want jobs. 